Jesus. <clears throat> 285, what a fellowship, what a joy to God. Let's sing the first and last, on the first together. We come down the home stretch now of our Men of the Word Conference. Father, we come today and just simply ask you to meet with us once again in a time of worship. Father, the things that will be said and preached and taught over the next few little, little bit of time that we have left, uh, I believe, Father, that if we'll take those truths and make the application, I think it could be transforming in our life. We pray, Father, that our hearts now are, we've cultivated uh, a receptive spirit and that, Father, that uh, we've already had good fellowship, we've already had good singing and worship in that area. And now, Lord, as we come and just enjoy the remainder of our day, would you bless and may you get all the honor and glory and praise from it now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Just before the men come and sing, I've asked Dr. Reed to come, and he talked to you pastors just a few moments ago, but he wants to kind of put a P.S. on uh, what he talked to you about uh, concerning uh, some ministries uh, here locally, something you may be interested in. So, Dr. Reed, why don't you come and, and uh, finish up what you started? Thank you, preacher. There's two uh, sign-up lists back at the college table. Uh, the college table is back in the corner of the foyer over there. And the sign-up lists are for two things. One of them is if you would be interested in having our tour group in your church. Uh, starting in April, we'll do some Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and May. And then we're going to tour this summer. Uh, last year, we went up through the Midwest, and we were in about 20 churches. A uh, great group of young ladies, and we'll talk to you about the college. And they have a good CD back there they've done. So you might be interested in that, and if you'd like information on that just sign up and we'll send that to you and they're just representing our college which started in uh, the year 2000 Dr. Smith was a founder uh, Dr. Laster has continued along the same uh, road right now we're not a big college but the Lord is really blessed uh, we're counted up now we have 31 churches that have been started or pastored by our graduates in the last uh, years and a number of those pastors are actually in the room today and God has been really really good to us and we're thankful for the opportunity to, to teach the King James Bible, to teach traditional music, uh, to treat, teach uh, church education, missions, soul winning. We've got, uh, in all of those areas, separation, those are the things that we teach. And if you want more information, it's back there. And if you'd like to have the tour group stop by, let me know. Second thing is, every year, and this is in your music packet, or the pack, not the music packet, but the package you got, every year we have, uh, for the last 10 years, we've done a music workshop. If you'd like to have your people come in, uh, from the different churches, and we work with song leaders, we work with pianists, uh, we work with special music, we're going to really emphasize special music and choir this year, uh, then let us know and we'll send you information on that, and that's in April, I think the 17th and the 18th, so those are two things you can sign up for. Thank you, preacher. One night upon the sea, a ship was tossing to and fro, breakers dashed on every hand, angry winds around it blow, all aboard were filled with fright, as the mighty billows rolled, then they called upon the water. Trouble. 
troubles seem as he did in days of old. All upon the life of fail, trust in him who never fails. I'm so glad he sails with me. He's the master of the sea. at his command, winds and waves obey his will, when he says to them be still, when man is this they all did say, that the winds and seas obey, he's the one who sails with me, he's the master of the sea. His command, winds and waves obey his will, when he says to them be still, what man is this they all did say, that the winds and seas obey, he's the one who sails with me, he's the master of the sea. I'm so glad he sails with me. He's the master of the sea. Thank you, guys. You know, isn't it great to be at a men's meeting? And uh, I love to be around godly men and I love to be fellowshipping with godly men and I appreciate you men being here and <clears throat> just enjoying talking about the Lord and talking about uh, what God has done in your life you know I've, I've had the great opportunity uh, to meet some new folks uh, folks that I haven't met before and by the way we come to a men's meeting I think we all ought to go out of our way to to get acquainted with people that we don't know uh, and just uh, you know, talk to folks and just uh, find out a little bit about them and, and uh, just to kind of see uh, what God is doing in their life. And I appreciate you men going out of your way to befriend so many folks uh, here today. You know, a men's meeting, if we would just uh, share what God has done for us, uh, you know, you're the greatest advertisement for a meeting. If God did something for you, go back to your home church and share that with other men and say, listen, you will not want to miss this next year to come. Not only did we have good fellowship, but man, we ate pizza. We're going to eat barbecue. And we're talking about Texas style barbecue. We're talking about the original barbecue. And so, but you need to tell them some more other than just that you ate good food, all right? So, but if God has fed you in the spiritual sense, go back to your home church and share that with some men and encourage others to come and, uh, and be with you uh, next year. I do want to say publicly a word of thanks to uh, uh, the staff once again uh, for, uh, uh, for taking the responsibilities of organizing. You know, a lot of times pastors, and you'll, you'll understand this as well, you know, a lot of times we get a lot of the credit for things that we didn't really do. We organized, we assigned and appointed, but we know who really does the work. Right. And, uh, and I want to say a, a special thanks to the staff. I want to say a special thanks to the men of Trinity Baptist Church and all the things that they did to make this conference possible. You know, over 23 years of the Men of the Word Conference, Dr. Smith and I have never stood on the platform and preached together in 23 years. This year, as I was uh, seeking the Lord's face about uh, what to do this year, and he brought that to my mind, and I said, Lord, you know, I'd prefer just, I, I enjoy just sitting in the congregation and being preached to, and just enjoying the preaching. But that wasn't his will uh, this year, and so uh, I, I'm happy to be on the same platform. And I'm going to get right on into it. We're not going to to, to dilly-dally long here. Take your Bible, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 24. Proverbs chapter number 24. While you're turning there, if you can listen and turn at the same time, 
When you go over to the epistle of James, James chapter 4 and verse 14, we've heard this verse quoted many times, but James asks a question. The question is, what is your life? It is even but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Do you often get up every morning or maybe periodically and you ask yourself that question? What is my life? Is it a life that's influential? Is it a life that has some credibility so that I can influence people? Gentlemen, may I say to you this morning that if we lose our identity, it will not be long until we lose our direction. And so we must keep our identity as Christian men. And that goes back to your life. That goes back to you managing your life for Jesus Christ. C.T. Studd said this, he said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And gentlemen, this morning, I want you to join me, if you would, and just take a look at your life for just a moment. And just examine where you are in your relationship with the Lord. Examine where you are in your home, what kind of employee you are. And what kind of church member you are? What, what kind of church member are you in the church? And are you supporting your church? Gentlemen, the pastor shouldn't be the only one that loves the church. The men of the church ought to love the church as much as the pastor loves the church. And ought to be willing to see it grow and to see it, it grow spiritually and numerically and financially. But it, uh, if for that to happen, it's going to have to start within us. That love is going to have to start within us, and we've got to cultivate that. I told the men just a moment ago in the, uh, in the split session, you know, every one of you men tomorrow when you sit in your church and your pastor stands behind the pulpit and he opens the Word of God, you expect him without question to be prepared, do you not? You expect him to be prepared and spent time with God so that he can stand and communicate a truth to you that you can not only, uh, that will not only resonate with you, but you can take with you and make that application in your life. So you expect the pastor to be ready. But can I be fair to all of us? Shouldn't the pastor expect the congregation to be ready? Amen. If he's going to prepare and preach, then the congregation, our heart, needs to be prepared. We need to cultivate our heart so it'll be ready to receive the seed Amen. of the Word of God so that that seed will fall on good ground. Yes, now, in order to do that this, this morning, gentlemen, in order for us to take a look at our life and honestly examine it, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I know it's going to be difficult, but I'm going to ask you, if you would, to set aside all of the cares that you've got on your mind for just a moment. Because if you're thinking about what's going to happen this afternoon and how you're going to solve this problem or this issue you're going to deal with, you're going to miss both messages this morning because your mind is on something that's not here. The most important thing happening in our life is what's happening right now. What's happening in our life right now is the most important thing. In our text verses that we're about to read, Solomon, it appears to be he's out whether he's riding his, in his chariot, his kingly chariot, or whether he's riding his kingly horse, or whether he's just taking a stroll in the countryside, stops and observes something, and he gives us some details about something that got, caught his attention, and he details it for us in Proverbs 24, beginning in verse number 30. So if you can physically stand, let's stand out of love and respect for the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 24, beginning in verse 30, Solomon writes, he says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles and covered the face thereof and the stone wall, which would have been the barrier or the standard around the vineyard, it also, he said, was broken down. Solomon said, then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come 
as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Now, I want you to go back, if you would, to verse number 30 is going to be our text verse. Solomon, whether he's riding, whether he's walking, whether he's just enjoying a daily stroll, he comes by a field and a vineyard, and he notices something unusual about this field and this vineyard. What he noticed about it was that it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered it, and the wall or the standard around the vineyard, which was a common practice in that day to keep out intruders and to keep people just from walking in uh, to the vineyard, the wall was also torn down as well. Now, what he noticed about this, whether, we, whether he knew the individual or not, it doesn't seem to, to indicate that he knew the individual, but he sure knew a lot about the individual by what he saw. By what he was able to observe, he was able to tell a lot about this individual. He was able to look at a vineyard and come to a conclusion about the individual that owned that vineyard. So this morning, gentlemen, I want to speak to you on this subject. I want you to take a look at your vineyard. That vineyard is your life. The person that's managing that vineyard is you. And notice that Solomon said, I went by the field. May I remind all of us, gentlemen, that God is watching you. There's not a thing that you do, a word that you say, or a thought that you think that God is not aware of in your life and in my life. So this morning, let's talk about that subject as Solomon in a proverb, but almost in a parable form, is trying to teach us something about paying attention to our vineyard. Father, we have but a few moments to learn. We pray that today that this truth would resonate in every heart. I pray that this morning, Father, that you would do something special and divine, that you would help us, Lord, to just stop, pause, set everything aside this morning and help us to see something about ourselves and take a look at our life because you tell us it's but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And we only have one life. And Lord, if we don't pay attention to it, it can get away from us quickly. And our life can be overgrown with thorns and nettles. And before we know it, Lord, we can become casual in our service. And we can become casual in our Christianity. And the next thing we know, we drop our standards and the walls around our life. And all of a sudden now the enemy is in and the intruders are in. And before we know it, Lord, we've changed. But it happens so casually and so slowly that, uh, that sometimes we don't recognize it and the purpose this morning is just to help us all from this pastor to the pew to give special attention to our life now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, gentlemen, before us is a parable literally within a proverb so that we can kind of stop and take a look because Solomon is wanting us to draw attention to something. He wants us to draw attention to the vineyard that he sees. And he wants us to give some particular close attention to what this vineyard is all about. But before we move on any further, let me help all of us with what a parable is. A parable is nothing more than just a short story that illustrates a moral or spiritual lesson. In other words, there is a truth within the story that we need to identify with. But then a proverb is nothing more than gentlemen, just a short saying that expresses a general truth for practical or scriptural living. So within our text verses, here's what we see. We see a proverb, but we also see a parable with a truth that's contained in the story. What Solomon is wanting every one of us to do and what God is wanting us to do is to look at this vineyard in the mirror of looking at yourself. And what he's trying to tell us is this vineyard here, your life can get out of hand by neglect. If, we'll just ne if we neglect only one area of our life, our vineyard can be overgrown with thorns and with nettles. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is this. Not only did he notice the condition of the vineyard, but I want to start from the outside and work our way in. One of the things that he noticed about the vineyard is that the walls or the standard around the vineyard was also broken down. Now, look up here at me, gentlemen. One of the things that we're seeing happen, even in our independent fundamental Baptist movement, 
is the standards are changing in our churches. And the standard of God's word has to remain in place if we expect our lives to remain in place like God desires them to be. Listen, let me tell you what happens. The inward man will usually be nothing more in the same condition of the standards of, the, of what we've set in our life. And if we allow the standards of our life to drop, what's gonna happen is the condition and the seriousness of our Christianity is gonna drop as well. You see, because biblical separation and soul winning and sanctification go together. You cannot have one without the other. And if we drop our standards of separation, it will not be long, gentlemen, until we see all the other things begin to fall by the wayside. One of the things that Solomon identified is he identified that the standards were broken down. And when he realized that the standards were broken down, maybe he came to the conclusion, now I understand why the vineyard is like it is. Because once the standard is broken, and the enemy gets in and the intruders get in and then neglect from the, from the person that owned the vineyard, then no, no wonder the condition of the vineyard was what it was. In that day, gentlemen, a vineyard was a prized possession to one. It was one that maybe they got by inheritance. People inherited uh, vineyards in that day or fields in that day. And maybe this was a, a vineyard that was inherited to maybe carry on the family business. For some, maybe it was something that they started themselves and it was they have a lot of investment of their time and their treasures in it. Maybe this vineyard was a source of income for somebody. Maybe it was a source of income for their family and maybe it was one of the ways that they took care of their family. Regardless of how the vineyard came into this individual's hand to maintain it, in order for it to produce and supply was going to take diligence, amen. It was gonna take determination, listen, and it was gonna take daily attention. Dear gentlemen, listen to this preacher. What I'm saying to you this morning is the Christian life is not something you check and maintain once a month. It's not like changing the air filter in your air conditioner at home. The Christian life is something that you have to maintenance and I have to maintenance every day of your life. You need to daily inspect the condition of your vineyard. My wife and I, five years ago, moved out to the Kennedale, Texas area. And uh, we built a home out there just to get away from the hustle and bustle. We lived about two blocks from AT&T Stadium for 20-something years. So to get away from that, we moved out and built out what used to be the country. It's not country anymore out there because they're building everywhere. But when we, when we built our home and stuff, they came out and sodded our front yard and backyard with Bermuda grass. I don't know where they got the sod from, but for two solid years, I battled weeds. I mean, I would, I, I, I would, I'd spent time out there pulling weeds up by hand. I'd gotten one of those weed poppers, y'all know what I'm talking about? And man, I got that thing in my hand and I attacked weeds. I was pulling weeds up left and right. I thought, this is crazy. It was like I was fighting a losing battle. I couldn't get, uh, it didn't, I couldn't seem to get ahead of, of, of pulling the weeds. What I, what I realized, it was going to take a daily effort. I couldn't just go out and decide, you know what? I'm going to pull the weeds in my front yard once a month. If I'd have did that, I wouldn't have any Bermuda grass. You probably, your front yard is probably like some, right? You're not mowing the grass, you're mowing the weeds. You know, what, you know what weeds will do? Weeds will continue to reproduce. They'll continue to come back until you take the necessary steps to get rid of them. I was trying to pull them by hand. I was trying to do it all myself. And finally I thought, this is crazy. So you know what I did? I hired a guy to come out and begin a treatment program. And you know something? I drove out of my driveway this morning and looked at my yard, not one weed. Now guys, if we think that we're going to accomplish a steadfast Christian life on your own, you're sadly mistaken. Christianity is a life that was given by Jesus Christ 
and it must be lived through Jesus Christ. And so our story today, and what I want to do is draw your attention and make some points that Solomon made in our text. So this thing of living the steadfast life, this thing of living the Christian life, it's going to take diligence. It's going to take determination, gentlemen. It's going to take daily action. As Solomon passed by this field, he stopped. I don't know if, this, if who this person was. I think it was definitely a resident of the city of Jerusalem or definitely it was a resident of Judea as he passed by. Maybe it was in the countryside. But one thing he noticed that somebody had neglected something that they had been entrusted with. Dear men, this morning you and I have been entrusted with the Christian life. It must be lived, but it also must be maintenance on a daily basis. It, we, must, it, we must take a look at it on a regular basis. And Solomon stopped and he began to analyze this particular field. And I want you to notice the first thing that he draws attention to was the condition of the vineyard. He brought attention to the condition that the vineyard was in. Notice if you would in verse number 30, he said, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding and lo, it, that's the vineyard, was not part way, not half of it, not one corner of it. What does it say in your King James Bible? It was all. So this individual not only neglected one portion, he neglected everything in the field and the vineyard. And so it was all grown over with thorns and nettles and covered the face thereof. So here's what Solomon does. He brings attention to the condition of the vineyard. And what he noticed was is the thorns and the nettles had choked out the grapevines. At one time, this vineyard was probably a productive vineyard. At one time, this vineyard probably was able to manufacture grapes and grape juice was squeezed out. And maybe that some of the grapes were taken to the marketplace and it benefited everybody in the marketplace. Maybe some of the precious sweet juices that were taken from those grapes were produced, produced grape, uh, grape juice to sit on the tables of families that enjoyed the freshness of the grape juice. You see, this vineyard, I believe without question, at one time, had some value. I believe at one time it was productive and it was able to minister to other people. But now the vineyard and the condition that it was in was no longer productive. It was no longer influential and it was no longer a source, look at me now, of benefit to anyone anymore. All because of neglect. One time it had some value. But what Solomon was looking at was a vineyard that had no value anymore. It was not beneficial to anyone anymore. Why? Because it had completely been grown over with thorns and nettles. Listen to me, dear friend. Listen, we get so caught up in the cares of this life, the thorns and nettles of this life, making money, paying bills, doing this, doing that. And if we neglect our own personal walk with God, our life will be just like this vineyard that Solomon was looking at. I wonder if he was looking at this vineyard. I wonder if he wondered, man, I wonder what this vineyard used to be like. I wonder what this vineyard used to be like when it was producing the sweet juices of the grape. I wonder what this vineyard used to look like when it was actually cared for and managed. Look up here, gentlemen, what I'm saying to you. He was wondering, I wonder what it used to be like. I wonder what some lives of people used to be like when they were in church. There are people that are scattered all over the Dallas-Fort Worth area that used to be in independent fundamental Baptist churches at one time. Their life used to be productive. Their life used to be beneficial to others. Their life used to be credible and influential to others. And now their life is completely grown over with thorns and nettles. And you know where it started? Because the walls and the standards broke down. And now the, the vineyard is in the condition that it's in. It all starts usually from the outside and works its way in. So Solomon is describing the condition of the vineyard. 
And I think, gentlemen, it was obvious that the vineyard and the fields and the walls had been neglected and they were unattended to. That outer wall was broken down. What a sad commentary, gentlemen, of a vineyard that once was productive, but now is pitiful. It was a vineyard that once provided for others. Now, look up here, now it provides for no one. It was a vineyard that once produced a crop of income, but now it has become a liability. It's now become an eyesore to the community. You know why? Because it takes a daily time that we give attention to the vineyard. See, the thing about it is the vineyard wasn't always that way. Somebody neglected the vineyard. And I think Solomon probably wondered, boy, I wonder what this vineyard used to be like. I wonder what this vineyard used to produce. I wonder what kind of influence this vineyard used to have. Gentlemen, can I say to you today, I don't want to be one of those people that used to be. I don't want to be one of those people that somebody's going to have to stand at my funeral and say, well, he used to be. He used to be. He used to be. Listen, I want to die climbing, dear friend. I don't want to die in decline. Can I say to all of us this morning, that vineyard didn't used to be in that shape. It got in that shape because someone neglected to give it attention. And it might have all, it might have just started, well, there's some thorns growing up in the corner of the field and it wasn't given attention and pretty soon those thorns and those nettles began to increase and they began to spread. And before we know it, Solomon said, it was all grown over. Gentlemen, never think for one second that the smallest of failures and the smallest of sins that come into our life are unimportant. You need to address them and you need to attack them by the word of God. I don't care how small we consider them to be. Because here's what I found out. A lot of little sins can cause a lot of big problems. And we've got to address that. If not, we're going to find our life completely grown over with thorns and nettles. So I said, first of all, Solomon said, hey, let's consider the condition of the vineyard. And all I want to ask you, gentlemen, this morning is, would you consider the condition of your life? Have you stopped going soul winning in your church? Have you stopped backing the Sunday school program and just become a Sunday morning only Christian? Thank you. Hey, when the preacher stands up in the pulpit and preaches men, are you saying, amen? Hey, have you ever thought about that the visitors that visit your church may wonder whether you agree with the preacher if you don't say something that agrees with what's being preached out of the word of God. The visitors that come to the church may think, I'm not sure they believe what he's saying. We need to back the preacher. Back it with with prayer and back it with amens. Hey, I just want to ask you, consider the condition of the vineyard. Solomon said, man, I wonder what it used to be. I wonder what it used to be like. But now it's all grown over. It's not being productive and useful for anything now. Then I want you to notice also in verse number 30, Solomon draws not only our attention to the condition of the vineyard, the second thing that he draws our attention to is the character of the owner. Mm-hmm. Let's analyze this just for, let's think about this. Could it be that the condition of the vineyard is in direct result of the character of the owner? Hmm. Look what he says about this guy. He said, I went to the field of the slothful. Look up here, gentlemen. As far as we know, we don't know if Solomon knew this person at all by name. But he didn't have to know the guy by name. All he had to do was look at the condition of his life and he determined what kind of character he had. He said, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void without what? Understanding. Understanding. So he draws our attention now to the character of the owner. You know, not much is needed to discern the keeper's character, right? Because all you got to do is look at the condition of the vineyard because that's all you need to know to determine what kind of character he's got. 
Gentlemen, can I say to all of us, and I'm honest when I say this, the only Bible that some people read is going to be your life. Your life may be the only thing that they know about Christianity. Hey, and I'm getting more and more convinced the further we go down the road, the reason that most of society out there is confused about church and confused about Christianity because they're not sure what a real church looks like or what a real Christian looks like. They're not even sure what one looks like anymore. Why? Because they look at the vineyard and they said, man, that church is all grown over with thorns and nettles. And, and they look at our lives and they think, man, their lives are all grown over with thorns and nettles. They're, in, they're dabbing in the same sins that I'm dabbing into. So he says, let's take a look at the character. Didn't even have to know the guy. All he had to do was look at his life. And he was able to turn that, determine what kind of character that he had. So the first thing that he analyzes here when he takes a look at the field and the vineyard about the character of this man is number one, that he was slothful. He was a slothful man. The word slothful means having no desire to act. It means having no desire to labor or to maintain. In other words, no desire to move forward. Now, there is a creature that has been called a sloth. I went on and pulled up online and that animal called a sloth, first of all, it's an ugly thing. It's a nasty looking ugly thing. I don't think he had anything to do with his appearance as far as what a sloth is supposed to look like. But I'm telling you, I'm not sure that that thing ever moved. That's the reason it got the name of a sloth. And if it did move, it barely moved. That's the reason it got the name of a sloth. Why? Because it had no desire to move. It had no desire to act. Gentlemen, I want to say to all of us from preachers to laymen this morning, I want to say we must understand we cannot get so comfortable in our comfort zone Amen. Our churches cannot be churches of our four and no more. Our churches, listen, have to be understanding that not everybody that walks through the doors of the church is going to be separated and sanctified like you are. We've got to help people to reach that point in their life. It's going to take some time. It's a process. Listen, folks, I look back on my life and I found out after I got saved, it took me about two years to be able to get rid of all the vices. Two years after I got saved. And yet, we expect people to get saved and baptized on Sunday morning and be back Sunday night. Now, that happens sometimes, but not all the time. We expect them to get saved and baptized on Sunday morning and be here Sunday night and Wednesday night. And if we have a Bible study, and, and by the way, we expect them to be enrolled in the Bible college. And they got saved Sunday morning and Sunday night. Folks, what happened here is the owner, the character of the owner was slothful. There's three things I want you to jot down. Number one, it's obviously that slothfulness comes from irresponsibility. He was irresponsible. Maybe that vineyard he got as an inheritance Maybe he built the vineyard himself and just got to a point to where, look at me, that he just got tired of life. Do you know Solomon got tired of life? Solomon didn't even follow his own counsel in the latter years of his life. Matter of fact, it got so bad in his memoirs called the book of Ecclesiastes that he made a statement, he wrote, that he hated life. How can you hate life? You're the richest man in the world. You're married to a thousand women. Maybe that was it. Maybe that was it. But Solomon became irresponsible later on in life. Slothfulness comes from irresponsibility. Jim, we have a responsibility. If you're married, you have a responsibility to your wife to dwell with them according to knowledge. Gentlemen, if you're married, you have a responsibility to your children to train them up in the way they should go that when they're old, they'll not depart from it. You have a job to instruct them and bring them up in their nurture and admonition of the Lord. Gentlemen, you have a responsibility not to provoke your children to wrath lest they be, or anger lest they be discouraged. We have a responsibility in our home. But gentlemen, wait a minute, we got a responsibility on our job. 
Now, let me back up when I say this. Your employer expects a day's work for a day's pay. And I don't think you can be right with God if you don't. You say, but he cusses and, and he's a heathen. What does that have to do with anything? He's signing your check. He's giving you an opportunity to have a place of employment. He deserves a day's work for a day's pay. And not only does he deserve a day's work for a day's pay, he deserves a day's work with the right attitude. We need to be grateful. You say, but man, he's a penny pincher. He hasn't given me a raise in, in, in how many years? Wait a minute, but when's the last time you've done anything for him? When's the last time that any of us have reached out to our employer and just maybe wrote him a thank you card and said, thank you for allowing me to be able to work at this company. I appreciate all that you do. You don't think that might make a difference? You say, well, preacher, that sounds like I'm soliciting a raise. Well, you call it whatever you want. But my, problem, my, my point is, if we expect the treatment from the employer that we think we deserve, then why don't we give that treatment to him? Seems like Jesus, when he was asked the question, Lord, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Oh, and by the way, and the second is likened to it, love thy neighbor as thyself. You want to be treated right by your employer? You might want to treat him right. Amen. And so that irresponsibility, so maybe that we, need to, we have a responsibility in our home. Gentlemen, we have a responsibility in the workplace. Oh, look, we have a responsibility in the church. Yes, we have a responsibility in the church. I don't think this happens with any churches here. But listen, it is, it is a crying shame if a church can't find men to teach Sunday school classes and men to do things and the women have to step up and do the jobs that men should be doing. That's a shame to God that women are willing to do the jobs that men should be willing to step up and do. We must not. Slothfulness comes from irresponsibility. Number two, slothfulness comes from an undisciplined life. Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down. And, uh oh, here's this wall thing again. And without walls. A person that has no rule over their own spirit is not going to have any standards in their life. They're going to have any, any separation in their life. So, gentlemen, slothfulness comes when there's irresponsibility or an undisciplined life. I told the men here in, in our split session, some people struggle with keeping a job. One of the things, I was into the secular world before I got saved. I didn't get saved until I was 26. I was in management in the secular world. One of the things, I had to fire people. They, couldn't even, they didn't have enough discipline to even get up and be on, to work on time. They couldn't even show up to work on time. They come in 15 minutes late and expect me to understand why they're 15 minutes late. Now, if it was one time, that's one thing. But if this is like two weeks in a row, there is a character problem. And so what happened is Solomon said, this guy was slothful, irresponsible, undisciplined. And then number three, he was just flat out careless. Just absolutely careless. Now, I'm going to say something here, and this is probably going to touch a nerve, but I'm going to say it anyway. Parents, daddies, just because you have your kids in church don't mean they're going to turn out right. It's a shame to God that we put the pressure on youth pastors to raise our kids and to train them when they, that needs to happen at home. He should be reaping the benefits of your training. Here, here, here youth pastor, fix my rebellious kid. Well, my goodness, you've had 16 years to get him this way. How can I change him in a matter of months? Gentlemen, look at me for just a second. Do you think this vineyard got the way it was overnight? No. No, this was neglect over a long period of time. I wonder if Solomon drove by this vineyard a couple of years before and thought, man, that is a nice vineyard. Man, that's a nice vineyard. Maybe that's what caught his eye because he rode by the same vineyard two years later and they weren't in church no more. Huh? 
And maybe he rode by and took a look at this person's life and says, man, what, what happened? I've run into people that used to be members of this church there that aren't even in church. You couldn't even recognize them as a believer. And I've just stopped and asked. I said, brother, what happened? Was it something I did? No, no, no. Usually it was carelessness. So irresponsibility, an undisciplined life, and he was just flat out careless. You see, one entrusted with a vineyard, either of his own making or whether he purchased it or inherited it, however he, this came into being, I'm here to tell you that the condition of this vineyard cost the owner. Thank you. And can I say something, gentlemen? The condition of your life is going to cost somebody. It's either going to cost your marriage, it's going to either going to cost your children, look, or even your grandchildren. It could cost your church. It could cost your employer. That's the reason our life, we need to examine our life. So Solomon took a look at the condition of the vineyard, and then he says, listen, I can already tell you, I don't even have to know who this dude is. I can tell you all about him. He's slothful, number one. Look at the second thing he said. And then the second thing that he said is he's void of understanding. When you're void of something, it means you're without it. And he said this guy was without vision. He, for some reason, he allowed the vineyard to be overgrown with these thorns and nettles and didn't realize, you know what? Grape juice just hit the stock market and went sky high. He didn't realize that what he had, and he certainly didn't have vision. He was unable to resolve in his heart the faults and failures of his own character. So you know what? He just let the vineyard go on and on and on and on. You see, the character of the keeper determined the condition of the vineyard. Let me tell you one other thing that Solomon brought attention and we'll stop here. Look at verse number 34. So he's riding by this vineyard. Maybe he had ridden by it before. Maybe he had gone by before and he saw what it used to be. Maybe he did. Maybe Solomon knew what it used to be. Or if this was his first time to go by this particular vineyard, he may have wondered, I wonder what this life used to be like. I wonder what this person used to be, what he used to be like before he ended up in this condition. You know, I was looking back here at Brother Jonathan Chandler. You know, Brother Chandler talking to these men that he deals with that are on the streets that are homeless. You know, I realize some of them may have some, some mental issues. Some of them may be struggling in that area. But I guarantee you there's a good percentage of them that are there because they want to be there. That leads me to the third thing that Solomon drew attention to. He said, take a look at the condition. I don't even have to know the guy. I can tell you his character by the condition of his vineyard. And then the third thing he draws attention to, Jim, look at this, is the consequences of his choices. The consequences of his choices. Here's the truth that we have to understand, that we, that we all must understand, gentlemen. God will allow each of us to make whatever decisions and choices that we want because he's going to be true to his commitment to the free will choice of man. But here's one thing we've got to understand. He will allow us to make the choices and decisions we want, but he determines the consequences of those decisions and those choices. We don't. So notice what Solomon said. He said in verse 32, then I saw and considered it and I looked upon it and I received instruction. And here's what he came to the conclusion, the consequences. He said, oh, I know why this is it. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. And then here's the consequences. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. He said, the condition, the consequences of this man is going to be the same consequences of any other man whose vineyard is in the same shape. Why? Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And folks, listen, if, if in that day, if that whoever that owner of that vineyard was, if he neglected his vineyard and it was in that condition, and Solomon said, I don't even have to know the guy, this guy that has any character, he's irresponsible, he's careless, he's undisciplined, and he may not even know who the guy was but he knew all about his character by the condition of his vineyard. 
And you know what Solomon came to the conclusion? Oh boy. The consequences of his choices are going to be just like the consequences of everybody else that's neglected their life. Of everybody else that's neglected their marriage. Of everybody else that's neglected their children. Of everybody else that's neglected their job. He said his consequences is going to be like a man. He says in his poverty shall come as one that traveleth. Listen, in that day, no one was able to travel fast from point to point, right? They didn't have airlines. They didn't have bullet trains. They didn't have the things that we had today. They had camels and donkeys. And if they didn't use that, they had a cart or a chariot. And if they didn't use that, they walked. They didn't get anywhere fast. You say, well, what are you talking about, preacher? What is he saying? What I'm saying is the vineyard didn't get that way overnight. The condition of it didn't happen quickly. What he's saying is that the poverty of the man whose vineyard's in this condition, it's a slow, agonizing process to, over time. It, listen, it may hit him in the home today. It may hit him on his job tomorrow. It may hit him financially later. But if he doesn't do something to get the vineyard back in good condition and, credibility, and have credibility and influence to where it's reaching out and ministering to others, he said that his poverty is going to come as one that traveleth. They walked. They rode a donkey. Very slow process. Anybody know people like that? They've neglected their life, their home, and it's been a slow process, and now they've crashed and burned. You see, the condition of the vineyard was not the result, look up here at me, was not the result of one or two bad choices. It was the result of poor character and behavior over long periods of time, and their life was in that condition. That vineyard was in that condition because of poor decisions and poor choices over an extended period of time. And it had to come at one point to where the thorns and the nettles came up and he neglected to address the issue. Folks, I'm telling you, if I had neglected to address the weeds in my yard, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be mowing Bermuda grass. I'd be mowing a bunch of weeds. I had to get somebody involved that knew how to kill the weeds. Because you know what? I couldn't do it. I, I, I was, it was killing me out there on my hands and knees, pulling them up. I thought, this is crazy. I'm trying to do this myself. I need to get somebody involved that knows exactly how to kill weeds. And gentlemen, this thing of the steadfast life, you're not going to do this by yourself. Okay, the Christian life is to be lived through Jesus Christ. Solomon said the consequences are horrible. Poverty was the consequence of poor character that had occurred over a long period of time. And then he says, thy want as an armed man. You know, it's been said that if you keep doing the same thing the same way, over and over, you're going to get the same results. I think somebody defined that as insanity, didn't they? Gentlemen, if we continue to do the same thing, the same way, we're going to get the same results. You say, well, what are you, what are you, what are you saying to do? Change. Change what you're doing. If, you keep, if we keep doing the same thing, the same way, we're going to get the same results, then what we need to do is, look, we need to go back here and change how we're approaching this. And look, Jesus Christ is the one that gave you this Christian life. He's the one that saved you from hell. He's the one that gave you the home and gave you the job. Our job is to steward it. Obviously, this guy with this vineyard was a poor steward. So gentlemen, this morning, just want to ask you, what's your life? You only have one, only have one. I want you to take a look at your vineyard this morning. Consider its condition. And then the second thing I want you to do is not only look at the condition, I want you to look at the character. All of us have character flaws, don't we? We know what they are. Some of us are big time procrastinators and it's gonna get you in trouble in the end. Okay, you can't, listen, the Lord is not going to be able to do anything in our heart until we first acknowledge the problem. We have to first acknowledge the problem. It's kind of like 1 John 1, 1, 9. If we confess our sin, that's acknowledging we got a problem. If we confess our sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, we have to acknowledge that we've got a character flaw because, listen, the vineyard, the areas of your life that you're struggling with, they didn't get there overnight. It's over a long period of time of bad choices and bad decisions. 
The condition of the vineyard is in direct proportion to the character of the owner. And the consequences, the consequences of our decisions and choices. Would you take a look at that this morning? And when you leave here today, would you determine, I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to better be a better employee or a better employer. Hey, I'm going to be a better church member. I'm going to be a better deacon. I'm going to be a better usher, a Sunday school teacher. Hey, I'm going to be a better soul winner. When I go back to my church, just examine the vineyard this morning. I want you to bow your heads.